Hello and welcome to this um, new webinar on uh, organized by Sadideo and Repsol Foundation, one of our um, founding sponsors at the Sadideo Center for Global Economy and Geopolitics. Today's webinar is um, about promoting energy efficient buildings through a green recovery. And um, we are uh, delighted to, uh, to have a great panel to be able to cover such an important uh, topic. The webinar is going to last for one hour and we really uh, appreciate uh, all you audience um, um, posting your questions through the chat and we'll make sure that we can answer as many as we can by the end of the, of the webinar. Um, before jumping into our topic, uh, an announcement on the 26th of April, we will be having the next webinar, uh, also on the energy transition, which is our focus of these webinars. And in that um, uh, webinar, we will be talking about decarbonizing transport, another crucial topic. Let me just introduce slightly um, and briefly uh, the topic uh, that we will be covering today, which is energy efficiency and building re renovation. Uh, buildings are responsible for 40% of EU energy consumption and 36% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is an extremely relevant uh, topic for, uh, for our energy transition that we are right now planning and, and uh, transiting. Um, uh, we need to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions of buildings by 60% uh, compared to 2015 if we want to uh, reach our 2030 targets. Um, uh, worryingly, only 1% of EU buildings gets renovated uh, each year. And in terms of deep renovations, those renovations that in involve a reduction of over 60% of emissions, only 0.2% of these buildings um, are actually um, renovated. So we have a huge challenge in front of us. We know that and uh, we will be talking about today the EU's um, announced renovation wave strategy, um, which it announced last fall, October 2020. And uh, we really want to jump into uh, detail into some aspects of this huge challenge uh, and uh, that we have in front of us. So uh, let me introduce you to the wonderful panel we have for today, covering different sectors and perspectives um, as, uh, as uh, we always try to, uh, to do uh, in our Sadejeo um, webinars. So first of all, um, we will have Tatiana Bostels, the Senior Economist at the European Investment Bank. Thank you, Tatiana, for joining us. Uh, Tatiana has experience uh, in the private sector as well. She's uh, been a leader in uh, private investment management and responsible uh, investments. She has been uh, also at the London Climate Change Agency. And she's currently a board member of uh, two interesting um, initiatives, the Building Performance Institute Europe and the Energy Efficiency Finance Institution Group. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, we also have Davide uh, Canarozzi, um, an Italian based in Barcelona. He is CEO and founder of GNE and uh, Finance. Uh, importantly, Davide holds an MBA from ESADE, uh, and uh, he founded uh, GNE and Finance in Barcelona a few years ago to provide services, solutions, and financing for decarbonization of building and houses. He is right now also leading similar initiatives in the Basque Country and the Balearic Islands. Thank you, Davide. Uh, Monica Frassoni will be our uh, is a third panelist today. She's the president of the European Alliance to Save Energy. She has been for a decade the mem a member of the European Parliament, co-president of the Green Group, and co-chair of the European Green Party. Currently, as I'm saying, she is the president of the European Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, and therefore still involved in politics, but uh, from the outside or outside the party. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fasson. And uh, finally, we have a representative for the Spanish government, 
we have uh, Vicente Torrego, Department Manager for the Director of Energy Efficiency at the Spanish Ministry. Uh, Vicente Torrego is a state mining engineer uh, with extensive uh, experience also in uh, the private uh, in the private sector with multinationals and companies. Thank you, Vicente, for for being with us. Great. So let's get going our conversation. Um, we are going to start with uh, Ms. Frasoni. Um, so, um, Ms. Frasoni, how um, how should the Energy Performance Building Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive, two key pillars of the renovation wave, be designed and uh, and thought uh, in order to be able to reach our ambitious uh, targets? Buenas tardes. Hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be uh, to be here. Of course, it would have been nicer to be with you in Barcelona, but uh, you know, this is uh, this is for the future, hopefully. So uh, first, let me tell you that it is very, very important that uh, both these directives, so the Energy Efficiency Directive and the EPBD, are part of the Green Deal. And the Green Deal is this large framework of um, initiatives of the European, uh, launched by the European Commission and now uh, um, become, became um, a patrimonial of all of us, uh, luckily for us actually, uh, that gives uh, um, the, the, the road uh, towards uh, European Union be able to um, realize the, and implement the targets that uh, and the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Um, and also, of course, uh, the uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. So we always have to take into account that all these legislations have to change in order to allow the European Union to become climate neutral by 2050. And since 2015 is near, but not too near, it is important that over the next uh, months, really, uh, the European Union gets uh, going also uh, in terms of its uh, intermediate target of 55% uh, reduction of emissions by uh, 2030. So these two uh, directives have to be adapted to these targets, which as far as energy efficiency is concerned, is not only a question of reducing emissions, but it is very much, as always in energy efficiency agenda, a question of improving the uh, quality of the houses where we live, and I believe that the COVID crisis also showed how important this is, and uh, to really adapt to the new times and to the hurry that we have in order to achieve targets. So the first thing that the Energy Efficiency Directive must do is to adapt the low targets that we already had, 32.5%, um, percent um, that we had defined before. Uh, I want to remind that this is a non-binding European level target and therefore the first thing that the EED must change is to go up with the target itself, 40% minimum, and to make this target uh, binding. Also another very important change in the EED that we are really striving for is to avoid uh, the current loopholes in the Article 7 of this uh, directive. I don't want to get too technical, but it is very important to know that this is basically the most important binding measure of this directive that is obliging uh, operators to reduce their output in, uh, uh, in energy every year and in an additional way. Uh, so the fact of being able to increase and to close all the excuses uh, that uh, that member states are using in order to make this uh, uh, this obligation less stringent is also a very important element. Last, I want to also touch the issue of the public building. Um, in this directive, it is said that we need to uh, renew a certain percentage of public buildings. This is very low. It is not very well um, uh, implemented, and we need to enlarge the category of public buildings. So if we reach these three elements in the EED, I think that uh, we would do a very good service to the European Union. As far as the e Energy Performance of Building Directive, the so-called EPBD, um, is concerned, um, we want to see a much uh, stronger push uh, for the level of reno for the amount of renovation every year. Uh, currently, we are around one percent. 
we need to reach 3%. So you, you, you understand how big this challenge, uh, this challenge is. In Italy, in my country, it's about 0.4% renovation uh, every year, so it is extremely low. And since, as you said, we, have, we need to reduce 60% of the energy output, we actually need to, um, to make sure that there are prescriptions in the EPBD that put energy efficiency first, but also that encourage um, the uh, renovation of, uh, of buildings in a binding, in a binding way. We will talk later about MAPS, but I think that also minimum energy performance standards. I think that also in, the, in this directive, this issue must be uh, very, uh, very much addressed. And last point, um, I believe that uh, the smart technologies should be encouraged also in this directive because the, these uh, smart technologies are also making the integration of energy efficiency with renewables and other uh, non-polluting ways of dealing with your home uh, a much uh, stronger push um, because our house is not simply a consumer of energy but it should become uh, something that is um, contributing to uh, to our climate objectives thank you thank you uh very much for that uh, uh first response uh i go on to uh, Ms. tatiana busto so I understand uh, you um, emphasize the importance of, uh, of uh, renovating European building stock. Um, how does how does the EIB actually uh, interact with national uh, with member states and, and their national strategies and climate plans? Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, indeed. As you have pointed in your introduction, and Monica Fassoni kindly emphasized, the importance of the EU, EU building renovation is, is very clear. How does that translate in terms of financial needs, uh, to put it into the perspective uh, of the European Investment Bank and private investors? to have a we really the real uh, system transformation, because we're looking at something like 280 billion per annum from now till 2030 in order to achieve that two to three percent rate of renovation that Monica had just mentioned. So coordination, cooperation with the member states and the EIB is a key element to ensure that we can, as the European Climate Bank, play that role. The role that we have with the member state is one of support. So the first way in which we engage with them is through dialogue. Uh, after the National Energy and Climate plans were released. We had a series of dialogues with the member states and looked into the long-term innovation strategies for those who had uh, them published to work with the member states and identify a pipeline of projects that were relevant to achieve their specific objectives. And we continue to do that uh, as part of the EIB engagement with the member states who are its uh, share uh, owners. But more to the point, what we want to do with them is to develop jointly new ways of thinking and innovative ways of financing. And for that purpose, the EIB has developed what we call uh, lightly our EIBR or EIB Renovation uh, Initiative or program, which is looking at taking a much more comprehensive uh, approach to energy <coughs> finance, as we know that there are some real barriers preventing it. And we want to act a little bit like a as is very popular at the moment, a one-stop shop for providing finance. But the way to do it in terms of innovative financing is to ensure that on one hand, we start by developing a strong, or supporting the development of a strong pipeline of projects. So we engage with member states to see how we can work with them to uh, support an accelerated development of technical assistance and project development assistance. One example, uh, we were speaking about um, technical assistance project development. In the EIB, we have developed the ELENA facility, which has proved extremely successful with every euro uh, spent on the facility, delivering 37 euros of investment on the ground. So we are now working with member states to see whether they would be interested through our JASPER initiative and ELENA to do a similar type of um, project development and technical assistance at uh, local, regional, uh, city level. So skills and knowledge are key. Um, up from cost also uh, can be addressed through that. Another approach as part of this EIB uh, renovation approach 
um, is to look at how to look at more innovative financing products. Guarantee risk mitigation mechanism have been developed over the last few years. And again, working with member states in particular, uh, we have an example in, in Spain, um, PF4EE, Project Finance for Energy Efficiency, has been uh, a very uh, useful way of learning how we can mix loans and guarantees to uh, increase the uh, an investment in energy efficiency. Uh, sustainable finance for sustainable building, another example with uh, some good uh, operations in, in Spain as well, which uh, again looks at how we can work with cities, with regions and with promoters, uh, mixing these loans and guarantees to make it more attractive for those developers, take the first risk uh, loss. We're also looking at developing uh, new products in the market, so we have worked uh, as part of the European Green Mortgage Initiative and have initiated a number of green mortgage uh, loans. And we are working with member states to see to what extent they are interested to push that further. So it's really a combination. And I shouldn't forget the, let's say, bread and butter of the EIB, which is direct lending co-financing. And uh, on average, we have invested four billions per annum on that in the past. And mixing all of those, we are trying to work with the member states to see what would be the best tailor financing products that work for them and how they can replicate it themselves through the national promotional banks on the ground. So it's about dialogue and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, we definitely need the EIB to, um, to accompany all member states throughout this um, challenging transition. So let's move to uh, a member state. Uh, we'll talk, uh, well, let me move first to uh, Davide Canarozzi uh, from GNE Finance. Um, how, um, how important is uh, and relevant economically this uh, renovation wave and how um, how important it is also to agree on some sort of standards of what is a deep renovation in order to help private finance also to join uh, and contribute to the challenge. Uh, thank you very much, Angel, for, for the uh, uh, invitation to participate to this uh, webinar and this great event. Um, and thank you very much to our audience to be here with us today. Regarding your questions, uh, how important is the uh, economic dimension of uh, the uh, renovation wave? It is very important to state uh, the economic dimension that goes well beyond uh, fixing leaking pipes or changing uh, broken boilers. The focus in understanding, it must be an, an understanding that buildings are critical node of energy production, storage, consumption, distribution, and exchange. That, of, that they are a node for future and present data generation and exchange. Uh, when, you know, Monica talked about the digitalization of the built environment, this is really uh, something important, not just in the commercial built environment, but especially in an increasing way in the residential spectrum as people is working more and more from home. And in the body generation, as people nowadays spend more and more time of their working time within homes. So these all translate in economic growth and therefore is of a supreme importance that uh, the renovation wave is also about renovating the uh, EU economy. As buildings are and will be more and more at the center of our lives in terms of comfort, health, very important, productivity and well-being overall. Um, so uh, coming to your um, second question um, regarding the uh, deep renovation, let me say that um, as, as of today, still there is no uh, clarity about uh, what a deep renovation is. And in the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, deep renovation is uh, uh, defined as a cost-effective renovation which leads to a refurbishment that reduces both the liver and final energy use um, of a building by a significant percentage which, uh, which then by the European Commission staff working document 
has been uh, uh, translated in uh, um, uh, uh, energy savings that are equal or above 60 percent. So in, in the light of, of uh, our current climate goals, um, which are indeed uh, ambitious but uh, reachable, uh, uh, the only possible way to achieve the long-term goals is to actually agree upon a common standard uh, and a definition of what a deep renovation is. And that is very important because um, all member states contribute to the uh, European climate goals and as such, deep renovation uh, must be a cross-border common de denominator to successfully measure and keep track of the impact of these uh, works, these projects. Also, the more we can go towards standardized um, definition of deep renovation and the more we can develop uh, solutions, services, um, uh, financing instruments that Tatiana was uh, mentioning before uh, that can properly address the deep renovation, which by itself is a challenge because um, people, when wake up in the morning, don't think about a, a deep renovation of their buildings or their house. Therefore, um, as, as uh, so far uh, has been a, uh, applied a very much top-down approach in the definition of policies, goals, um, standards, but we need to be able to mobilize the demand uh, at the grassroots from people, from community of owners, from building owners for these type of measures. And um, I guess later on we will talk about uh, minimum energy performance standards, but we believe that it's essential to have a mix of clear standards for deep renovation, coupled with uh, minimum en energy performance standards that must be mandatory and progressively increasing for all the member states. And those must be coupled with solutions that are uh, able uh, to address the um, technical assistance the people needs for uh, bringing ahead this project with financing solutions that can uh, give the resources and the means to make these uh, projects uh, feasible. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that um, comment. So now we can move on to our member uh, state, uh, uh, to a member state, which is uh, Vicente Torrego. Uh, Vicente. Uh, so how is the long-term renovation strategy for the building sector in Spain, which I understand you are not right now developing, uh, how is it, um, how, how, how is it and what are the main uh, strategic uh, uh, dimensions of it? Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much, Angel. Uh, well, the, the efforts to be done in the long-term strategy focus on the supply side and also on the demand, which is currently not mobilized. In the Spanish National Integrated Energy and Climate Plan, the PENIC, PENIEC, uh, were defined targets for 2030 for the improvement of energy efficiency in buildings. And regarding uh, the long-term strategy for energy rehabilitation in the building sector in Spain, the ERESE, uh, according to the Energy Efficiency of Buildings Directive, all member states will develop a long-term strategy to support the renovation of its national parks of residential and non-residential buildings. In compliance with this, Spain has developed the RSE 2020. Its objective is to support the renovation of the stock of residential and non-residential buildings, both public and private, for its, for its transformation into an efficient of Europe evaluated the ERESE as the best of the national strategies presented to the European Union. ERESE is the update of previous strategies presented in the years 2014 and 2017. What are the actions included in the ERESE? Uh, the coordination between different public administrations and stakeholders, uh, the development of legal and administrative framework facilitating instruments to the municipalities to implement actions, uh, rehabilitation of public buildings, and as, as an example for the sector, uh, public financing and improvement of tax policies, 
promotion of private financing, fight poverty, promotion of new energy model in buildings through the regulation of thermal facilities in buildings, the, the RITE, that has been very recently approved. It facilitates, among other objectives, the integration of thermal renewables and promote the electrification of the thermal demand of buildings. And also the new Royal Decree for Energy Certification in Buildings that is going to be published soon. It will increase uh, the, the value of buildings energy certification. Uh, the energy certificate is very important to know the energy performance of buildings and how the rehabilitations would improve it. Also in the uh, activate rehabilitation through initiatives as energy passport or the sustainable municipality label in the supply side to professionalize, modernize, boost training and digitalization, information to the society and information exchange between public administrations, implement statistics and indicators of finance projects in order to evaluate the results of public policies. Uh, regarding the financing aspects, uh, the RSA includes the public financing programs at the state level as the Central Administration Buildings Plan, uh, the PARER, or currently named PRE programs, that is to say the program for building energy rehabilitation, uh, financing of pilot projects of local energy communities uh, 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 that uh, is being built by the IDAE, the Institute for the Diversification and Energy Savings. Uh, ECO, Official Credit Institute line, uh, and European funds. Likewise, LSA also includes public financing programs at the regional and municipal levels. Uh, I want to tell you some specific features uh, of the Building Energy Rehabilitation Program, PRE, that I mentioned uh, before. The PRE was approved uh, in August last year and regulates the aid program for energy rehabilitation in existing buildings. The budget for this program is of 300 million euros. The eligible actions correspond to three types, improvement of the thermal enclosure or skin of uh, buildings, energy efficiency of thermal facilities, and lighting. Uh, the amount of the basic aid of the pre-program for actions in whole buildings will be 35 of the eligible cost of all types of action, except in the case of energy efficiency improvements in lighting installations, in which the aid will be 15%. Uh, uh, in the event that rehabilitations are chosen in, the, in individual homes or, or premises within buildings, this percentage will be 25 and 15% respectively. It may have different additional aid depending on the use of the building and on social criteria. Uh, for example, actions that raise the energy rating, integrated actions, uh, renewable energy communities or citizen energy communities, uh, or if it meets uh, some social criteria, it will obtain uh, additional aid. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh I think we had some technological problems, but we overcame oh. them successfully. So um, uh, uh, wonderful. So let's let's move on, Miss um, uh, Frasoni. So before um, your um, Davide Canarozzi mentioned the minimum energy performance standards. So what are they, and how important are they in in this uh, renovation? Work? I think you're muted. Yes, can you hear me now? So the uh, minimum energy performance standards are, as the name says, uh, is a way through which uh, you can orientate the renovation you do. Because actually one of the problems that, uh, that, uh, that, we, that we had and that we still have in, uh, in, uh, in energy efficiency issues is to see um, how to measure from one side and how uh, to make sure that what you actually do is having an impact in terms of reduction of, uh, of energy consumption and also of, uh, of emissions. And, uh, and this has not always been the case. In some cases, the uh, standards or the uh, prescription have been formal. So in some cases, in Italy, for example, you had a situation in which you counted certain things um, as if 
um, the savings would have occurred. But in reality, the savings did not occur because they are not measured. They were not measured. And what happens is that they are simply taken for granted because you do certain things like buying uh, light bulbs. But if you don't put them, you don't, you know, you just keep them in your in your in your uh, in your drawer and you don't use them. But still, those are calculated. Of course, this is a little bit of an extreme, but this indeed happened. So the minimum energy performance standard is a way through which you can avoid that. Of course, there are many ways in which you can define this minimum energy performance standards. And uh, actually this morning, the commission made uh, a, a seminar on, on exactly on this, trying to ask to different stakeholders, there were about 200 people uh, taking part of this seminar, what is it they wanted um, and how European these minimum performance standards would be, because we all know that member states use the magic word flexibility when uh, they actually want to do whatever they like uh, in, uh, in and in some cases you really need flexibility but you also need uh, some kind of general guidance so as far as the general guidance are concerned um, we believe that uh, you have to start from the worst performing buildings uh, and you have to get them to uh, uh, increase their performance basically to jump their energy classes um, also the the uh, you have to link this minimum, um, the minimum standard to the long-term renovation strategies. This is also something that is very important, is a major victory because of course you, you know that we said earlier that you don't have uh, binding targets, but you have all sorts of plans that uh, member states have to do and notably these long-term uh, renovation, um, renovation strategies. And if you put together some of the uh, uh, of the minimum standards with these uh, targets and the, these objectives of the long-term innovation standards, the um, strategies, then these uh, standards become a little bit more uh, sensible. Um, another also uh, another element that uh, that uh, uh, you can find is, uh, and I will finish here, is to use uh, an example that I find very interesting from France. In France, they said. Um, that as of 2023, you basically cannot rent out your apartment or your house unless it has a certain standard in terms of energy performance, but also in terms of salubrity and all the rest of it. And out uh, and in, in um, after 2028, you have an obligation to uh, uh, renovate the worst performing uh, building. So. All these kind of things tell, tell you that, that there are many ways in which you can define the minimum perform the minimum standards, but there must be a European guidelines, even if you have to, of course, to ensure uh, that uh, uh, there is a certain flexibility at member state, because of course, a house in the south of Italy or of Spain is not the same uh, as a house in, uh, in Finland. Uh, although, of course, the question of getting your house cool is becoming increasingly challenging and having a warm house uh, is uh, uh, is not um, is becoming uh, not more important than having a cool house so i think that this is uh, uh, is, is a little bit the uh, the question that uh, is also very much linked to uh, the energy performance uh, certificate uh, that is also another uh, another element of this conversation that will help us making a jump above all if we can make it a little bit more European and more measurable, actually. Thank you. Thank you. So that really underscores the importance of standards and, and definitions to make sure that we, we walk uh, we walk our talk in terms of energy transition. Wonderful. So let's move on to uh, think and talk uh, slightly about the relevance of the private sector. Uh, so perhaps, um, Ms. Tatiana Bustos, perhaps you can uh explain a little bit what uh the eib does in terms of trying to activate and mobilize uh private sector uh investment yes i i briefly introduced how we cooperate with uh, member states regions cities uh beforehand but as i mentioned originally the uh, financing amount that is needed to achieve the ambitious innovation sites we are speaking about here means that the private sector must play a very important role. So what we do at the EIB and a, a number of um, national promotional banks is the objective is always to crowd in private investment. That weird word means that 
for every euro that you invest, you uh, ensure that uh, one euro of private money is also invested, if not more. Uh, that being said, in the particular case of uh, energy efficiency and in the context of the COVID economic crisis, uh, those numbers actually um, can be revised to, to ensure that investments are taking place indeed. In terms of, uh, I think it's useful also to focus on um, some uh, specific examples to show you how we do that. I've mentioned two uh, innovative financing products, which I think are worth explaining in a little bit more detail uh, to explain how they bring in uh, private sector money. Um, so one is the private finance for energy efficiency. And what we do there is financial intermediaries are provided by low-cost EIB loan, but also subsidize expert support through technical assistance and project development assistance to ensure that the people that they will themselves lend the money to have the skills and the ability to design uh, products, energy efficiency, building renovation uh, products that match the financial intermediaries risk uh, and investment needs but also provide um, a first loss piece to motivate those financial intermediaries to put their own monies to finance energy efficiency uh, at the scale that we know that we need to achieve the european climate ambitions the green deal but also the covid recovery as was uh, mentioned before in terms of economic uh, recovery so subsidize expert support and uh, assistance and guarantee risk mitigation together in one package. That was uh, PFOE does. A similar type of innovative product that was developed is the sustainable finance for sustainable buildings. The aim was to encourage um, managing authorities to use structural funds, i.e. EU monies, in combination with some EIB um, capital monies to jointly with some guarantees provide risk sharing instruments so that commercial banks will then commit to on land on and to build up portfolios of residential energy efficiency uh, loans. Uh, I would be honest with you and say it's not being fully straightforward. The private finance for energy efficiency has been relatively successful. The sustainable finance for sustainable buildings, there's been a lot of learning in the, in the first four years of uh, operation. And that is, we hope, going to uh, enable a, a stronger deployment uh, of those instruments, because at first there were some real uh, issues in terms of making them acceptable uh, to the market. But a very specific example uh, in Spain, with the sustainable finance for sustainable building, we financed uh, the IB contributed, so co finance uh, energy efficiency building renovation AEM, which was looking at the metropolitan area of Barcelona. And the operation aim was to facilitate affordable financing to homeowners belonging to low or very low income groups, and thus to promote a larger pipeline of renovation. Another interesting um, product uh, showing how this co-financing works is I've mentioned that we have been working with the European Green Mortgage Initiative. Uh, we did our first big green mortgage um, product with uh, Spain, with UCI in Spain, looking at ensuring green, green mortgages were made available to finance construction of either new buildings, but also innovation. And what is very interesting here is working with uh, homeowners associations in Spain, as uh, you probably know, there's a very high number of multi-apartment building blocks in Spain that need uh, renovation. And there's always a difficulty to work with multiple owners. So this specific uh, program aims to co-finance with a local bank, the renovation of buildings, and working with uh, house uh, owners association and taking on the point very important i believe made by davide that you need to bring the homeowners to the table there is also a project assistance and a technical assistant piece which aims to train um, those homeowners association and um, 
the providers of uh, services to them, such as architects and others, to understand how they can replicate that exercise across various multi apartment building blocks uh, in, in various uh, regions in Spain. So that gives an idea, but the aim is very much to work in partnership with the member states and the region as much as in partnership with private finance providers. Great. So let's move to a, a private finance provider um, or, or across the sector to the private sector and Davide Canarozzi. So what are some of the innovative financing schemes that we are seeing or that are available or could become available? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Angel. Well, um, look, when it comes to uh, innovative financing scheme, uh, uh, innovation de uh, ch bar changes depends on uh, where you're looking for. Um, in the US, in, in the last decade, uh, uh, large innovation has been the pace financing, where they've been able to attach the financing on the assets with uh, uh, what is called on tax financing, and that allow uh, long-term uh, uh, financing in the uh, uh, home and building renovation. Then if we look at Italy, uh, a very interesting uh, innovation is the, um, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the growth, the development of what it was called the eco bonus and that became the super bonus which uh, it finance up to 110% of uh, the project through uh, fiscal credits. And these fiscal credits can be, uh, are, uh, can be tradable to third parties like utilities or banks. And that uh, makes this instrument uh, uh, very equitative also for people that uh, normally cannot use fiscal credits to finance up to 100% of uh, their own uh, uh, building or home renovation project. In Germany, uh, the, uh, the scheme developed by KFW has been very successful in the last uh, couple of decades, if, so it's, if we can talk about innovation and in the long term. And, uh, and in France, and, and another interesting scheme is uh, the ECOPRE. So I would say that apart from what uh, uh, Tatiana has been mentioning, uh, there's been uh, interesting uh, uh, developments um, in different member states. Uh, what, if you look down to Spain, um, uh, there are mixed results, uh, especially if we uh, try to look for uh, innovation that then can be scaled up at a national level. It is, uh, it is correct, indeed, uh, uh, the, the example that uh, Tatiana made um, are quite interesting. Banks have been uh, uh, starting to develop uh, loans for community homeowners, uh, but uh, these uh, loans uh, are not uh, always accessible to all communities. So the, the vulnerable ones are uh, normally the one in high risk of exclusion. And um, uh, in that regard, uh, the, uh, um, the, the product that the EIB developed in collaboration with the uh, AMB uh, looks uh, very promising. Um, the, uh, uh, the limit that we see in that, uh, um, that uh, product is the, the capability to scale up uh, to the whole uh, country. And that's why um, what we have been doing is uh, um, trying to focus on solutions that can incorporate innovation, collaboration, and fairness. Uh, really focusing on the grassroots of uh, building renovation sector, interacting with local as well national stakeholders. Uh, with that, what I meant is that it is very important to understand the demand side of uh, the home and building renovation sector. Most of initiatives, policies, and regulations have a top-down approach that mix, uh, that sometimes miss um, a central point, which is we really need to be able to stimulate demand. Uh, otherwise, uh, there are the, the risk of developing excellent financing instruments that then are uh, go on un unused or underutilized 
is extremely high and it happened pretty often. That's why um, what, what we've been doing in the um, uh, growing and developing on the Europe's uh, uh, financing scheme and, and experience is the development of the Open, Open Gala program in Euskadi, uh, which we believe is an excellent implementation of innovation, collaboration, and fairness together with the, uh, the local administration, the Basque government. So there, what we did is the development of uh, financing instruments that is coupled with uh, a credit announcement mechanism that is called the Social Guarantee Fund, uh, which, has, which is, has the goal to be a, a, an effective, inclusive, inclusive and easy to set up financing scheme that can propel energy renovation in, uh, for all the citizens, including the vulnerable groups. And um, now we are in the piloting stage in four cities, uh, Bilbao, Eibar, uh, Lazarte, and Durango in the, uh, in, the, in the Basque Country. And the goal is to uh, um, uh, open the, this program to the whole city. Um, this, uh, this scheme results in a credit enhancement mechanism, as I said, um, especially open to vulnerable groups that quite often do not have access to uh, private financing. Uh, whilst at the same time, a significant proportion of their, of, of their uh, monthly income goes directly to pay energy bills. So really, uh, we need to help these people to find solutions and uh, to break you know, the, the vicious circles of, of energy poverty. Uh, therefore, at Gini Finance, uh, we try to promote implementation of mechanisms uh, in, in, in which uh, strong social and, and, and environmental impacts are really at the core of them. Um, and that's why we really uh, are observing a, a strong interest from stakeholders and impact investors in participating in, uh, in this type of schemes. Um, yeah, I would say that, that that's all for it the moment. Thank you. Thank you, um, Davide. So uh, let's move to, um, to the um, back to uh, Mr. Vicente Torrego. So how does the Spanish plan uh, uh, um, uh, connect with the recovery, uh, the recovery fund, the next generation Europe? How does, how does uh, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, Spanish strategy uh, connect with the renovation of, of, of buildings and the next generation Europe? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, there are up to 10 policies in the recovery, transformation and resilience plan of Spain. Uh, the component two of the first policy is the rehabilitation of buildings and urban regeneration. Uh, the main targets of this component are the carbonization of the buildings, heating and cooling. This this through the improvement of efficiency and the use of renewables, uh, thermal and electrical renewables. The renovation of public buildings, fight against energy poverty, in relation to the demographic challenge to boost the building's renovation in rural areas. Uh, other additional targets of uh, this matter is the digitalization of buildings and increase uh, the number of local and renewable energy communities that canalize the implementation of the renovation. In this component, there are 11 reforms and investments, but the most important are the following. The implementation of the urban plan for Spain. It includes, among others, to prevent and reduce the effects of climate change and boost the circular economy, the RS that uh, I explained before, uh, to implement the one-stop scheme or single window to facilitate facilitate aids, financing, and tax matters, um, and also programs of energy rehabilitation for the socioeconomic recovery in residential areas. Uh, there are two types of programs: uh, program, programs uh, for districts and programs for buildings. Uh, the actions included in these programs are related to envelope or enclosure of the buildings and thermal facilities, uh, sustainable mobility and digitalization, uh, renewable energy use, 
improvements in access, safety, and maintenance. Uh, there are two models of programs, uh, transfers to the autonomous regions. This will make their specific uh, programs based on general rules defined by the central government and uh, to compensate the fiscal incentive. Uh, continuing with investments of this component uh, is also the Building Energy Rehabilitation Program, the PRE, uh, the program for the energy transition and demographic challenge, also, the plan for the energy transition in regional and local administrations uh, that are focused on energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainable mobility, including the renewable of the public vehicles fleet. Um, and it's estimated it accounts for approximately a 25% of the budget of this component. And uh, also regarding private investments, it it's interesting to say that to push the renovation projects, uh, public-private cooperation is important to supplement public subsidies. The, the public subsidies, such as PRE, are not enough to handle the potential investments needed. It is necessary to increase the flow of private capital towards energy efficiency and the integration of renewable energies. And finally, it's expected that the private sector and financial institutions can activate specific financing instruments such as wind mortgages, uh, europeans or others, aligned with the taxonomy regulation of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we are heading towards the end of this um, very interesting panel. There's one question uh, from the uh, audience. Um, by Sergio Martinez Burgos, who asks, so, um, and perhaps um, uh, I'll start with Davide, but others can jump in. Um, do, does the capacity to implement these projects exist in uh, practice? So uh, do we have the skills, which Tatiana Bustos had mentioned before, uh, do we have the skills and do we have the supply side in, 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 to a certain extent of, 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 of to be able to execute these types of projects. Thank you very much uh, for, for the question. <laughs> Indeed, uh, I was hoping I mean, that uh, this question was coming uh, out because uh, it, it, it is really at the core of uh, one of the uh, main challenge that I do believe we have uh, at European level, and in, in our case, uh, uh, specifically in, in Spain, uh, for really addressing and being able to achieve the goals that, that uh, the same Spanish government embraced. Uh, with uh, you know, uh, there's been a bold move from the Spanish, uh, Spanish government to uh, uh, to achieve half a million of uh, uh, residential units renovation uh, by the end of 2023. Um, and I mean, uh, we, uh, we 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 really um, find this a, a great move. And also, uh, they uh, announced the uh, almost seven billions of funding in grants and subsidies for uh, homeowners and, and communities of owners to execute projects. So, but then the risk here that, uh, that there will be financing instruments, that there will be grants and subsidies. Uh, so everything is in place, and maybe uh, it, we are uh, able with the right uh, elements to stimulate the demand. But then, is the sector ready? Uh, as of today, my clear answer is no. Um, this is one of the most fragmented, atomized uh, sector in which there is um, a, a, a huge um, disconnect between where the economy and society is as of today, which is completely digital. Uh, and completely standardized, industrialized solutions to where is the sector of the rehabilitation. As of today, there are no companies that are focused exclusively on rehabilitation. One of the big issues is because everything moves with subsidies. Subsidies generate market distortions because all the operators know that for some months of the years, there will be subsidies and so they will do works. But some of the rest of the year, there won't be subsidies and so there won't be works. And so they go back to uh, new construction. So really what we need to create is um, clusters of uh, where different stakeholders from uh, uh, engineering university, architecture and, uh, universities, associations of the sector are able to create hub 
of training uh, of uh, the all the professionals that works in the uh, value chain of uh, doing the uh, value renovations and these body and these building renovations sorry has to be completely digitalized it has to be industrialized we have to minimize the time in the in on site and maximize the time of preparing all the material all the parts off site what there are the results that are going to be achieved that have to be completely uh, be able to be simulated everything has to go uh, through working in in uh, bim technology and in 3d so there there's a lot of work that needs to be done in getting a, a capacity the thousands of people and companies that work in this sector and as of today i don't see these uh, capacity building there i don't see the focus and the effort enough there so i really believe and we are working hard uh with the uh, local administration and with stakeholders to build this uh, capacity but this is really for me a very important message at national level and local level we got to work together public and private sector in order to build this capacity of executing projects otherwise a familiar won't happen by 2023 that's for sure thank you thank you david so let me I'll broaden up a little bit that question to pose it to Tatiana um, Bustos and then to Monica Frassoni. Uh, whether you want to comment on this as an obstacle, the executive, the capacity to execute these projects, or uh, if there are other obstacles as well that you want to underscore. Tatiana Bustos, please. I, I believe it's um, it's an important obstacle. It's it's very much ensuring that this the speed at which we are developing projects is increased to the rate that we need to uh, achieve. That being said, um, what we have seen in, in, can you hear me okay? That being said, what, what we have seen in the last uh, five years is really a steep learning curve on how to better provide technical assistance and program development assistance, and also a recognition from uh, member state institutions, uh, member states, European institutions, the likes of the EIB and national development banks of the, the very important aspect of providing this uh, technical assistance and uh, program develop project development assistance that Davide was mentioning. I will extend it a little bit further and say that it's probably even more challenging because we do also need to train the other actors that form part of the building re rehabilitation. The uh, project that I've mentioned in Spain, uh, the Green Mortgage, it's really interesting because we're also now training real estate advisors, uh, architects, so it is quite a complex ecosystem of uh, skills that are uh, required. Um, and on the other hand, to finish on a positive note, with the recovery and resilient funds, as we have heard from Vicente, it does offer, added, adding that to the structural funds which are available, there are sources of funds that can be used to develop local Elena uh, one-stop shops, uh, JASPERS uh, initiatives uh, that can actually train trainers to replicate that at the scale that is indeed needed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Monica Frassoni. Um, yes, I think that uh, this question of the implementability, let's say, of, uh, of the different projects has, uh, has been already said at least uh, two elements that have to be taken into account. One is the complexity uh, and the issues that have to do with the uh, local or national administration. And uh, we know that in uh, some countries, this is a major issue uh, because the issue of absorption for countries like Italy and Spain um, is not there only for this uh, big uh, chunk of, uh, of, of, uh, of the, of the um, PNRR, but the, it's also there for normal funds. Spain is, uh, for the moment, the worst absorbing uh, country, and Italy is the second. So uh, this is uh, not only there for energy efficiency, it's, it's a general issue that has to do uh, with administration, that has to do also uh, with uh, regulatory obstacles. And we have been advocating for a long time I insist not only for energy efficiency, but also for energy efficiency, uh, where you have to put together different stakeholders, um, that the European Commission should be more clear and should issue guidelines 
that uh, have also uh, not to complicate things, but have to make things easier, actually. Um, has to diminish the regulatory needs uh, that uh, uh, that are requested um, in order to access the different funds, and uh, have to make uh, have to help um, the, the the beneficiaries to have an easier life. So I think that there is a real issue here that is uh, both uh, from the European side and also from the national side. But also, I think that uh, there is uh, now a very big consciousness, and this is my second point, the technical support and assistance is a major element of the success uh, of all these uh, uh, programs. When you hear, for example, then, then in some, in some uh, um, cases you have uh, projects that are proposed and then uh, there, are, there are only one or two that are accepted on, I don't know, uh, 15 or 20, then uh, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have an issue. And I think that it was a very good idea from the part of the Commission to allow, if I understood correctly, to make sure that in the next generation in EU, EU and in the national in the in the um, uh, in the facility, uh, you can have a sort of cross-cutting um, budget line for technical assistance or for technical support. And I think that that is something that member states should be really uh, use, ready to use, and should help beneficiaries to use as well. What is technical assistance? Technical assistance is basically to hire people that can help you um, at the different levels to uh, make the projects and to make them um, you know, sustainable, basically, to make them acceptable. This sounds very easy, it is not, uh, but I believe that uh, either, I mean, also DG Reform and other uh, offices of the European Commission are very much aware of this. Uh, it is only that the member states, local and regional administrations should be even more aware in order to make sure that taxpayers' money is not either badly used or not used. And uh, the risk is really huge for, for, uh, for the facilities and is also very big for energy efficiency. Uh, I, uh, I probably you know that the Court of Auditors said that in the past um, energy efficiency were among the least well used funds in the EU. So I think that uh, uh, there I'm talking about the energy uh, part. So there, there is really a lot of things to do. Uh, but as I said, there is much more awareness um, and uh, and also capacity to, uh, to deal with, this, uh, with these questions. Thank you. So uh, wonderful. We're, we're running a, a out of time. So let me do a last round of a five to 10 second intervention per each one of you just to finalize with a tweet, uh, with a tweet type statement. Uh, so I don't know, Mr. Vicente Torrego, perhaps you want to start? Yes, of course. Yes, uh, only I want to say finally that uh, the rehabilitation of uh, buildings is of uh, paramount importance in order to make our cities uh, clean and uh, to reach the objectives of uh, carbon emission reductions of mm -hmm. uh, Europe, of, of the member states. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Davide Canarotti. The renovation wave is achievable, but we must be able to couple the essential elements, which are clear policy with mandatory requirements and clear consequences, innovative financing that is able to be accessible to all citizens, including vulnerable collectives and vulnerable people, and uh, uh, combining with capacity building that has to go well beyond uh, technical assistance at high level, but has to be at uh, city level, at local level, in the whole value chain, so that we can create authentic fast track uh, for uh, building renovations uh, within this uh, program for decarbonizing our economy and creating uh, the new economy, uh, uh, a sustainable one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiena Bustos. 
Yes, it's very clear that building renovation uh, offer ways to address both the, the post-COVID economic recovery uh, crisis and deliver multiple benefits. We've mentioned job creation, citizens' health, sustainable economic growth, and the climate uh, ambitions. To do that, we indeed need new ways of thinking and financing energy efficiency that combine traditional uh, loans with innovative financing and guarantee products and provide technical and development assistance to strengthen project development across the whole value chain of building renovation. It's an ambitious project, but in the situation that we are now with the Green Deal and the Recovery and Resilience Funds, we are in the best, best position that we could think of in terms of making those, those funds be used in the most effective way. Thank you. And finally, Monica Fresco. Well, first, let me say that I agree with everything that my co-panelists said. Uh, and then I just want to say that there will uh, not be a um, Europe that is climate neutral by 2050 without a major success of the renovation wave. Thank you. So thank you all for that, uh, for the full panel and also for these closing, uh, closing statements. Um, I thank you all for, for your availability and for joining us in this um, in this uh, in this webinar. I want to uh, remind our audience that on the 26th of April we will be having another webinar, this time on decarbonizing transport. Uh, more on this soon. And finally, uh, thank also I want to thank our partners, Repsol Foundation, uh, for um, for their support and and for the collaboration in organizing these events. Thank you very much, and see you in a few weeks. Ciao. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.